Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tax Talk, the broadcast of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, powered by RoadkillRadio.com. My name is Jordan Bateman, and I'm the British Columbia Director for the CTF, a nonprofit advocacy organization dedicated to just three things lower taxes, less waste, and more government accountability. That's what frames all the advocacy, research, and communications work we do. Thank you for joining us today. We hope this episode will serve to educate and entertain you, inspire and even infuriate you from time to time, but most importantly, give you a better picture of the challenges facing our country today. If you log on to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash taxpayer.com or visit our blog at taxpayer.com slash blog, you'll be able to see all of our new Tax Talk episodes as they come on stream, or you can download an audio version via iTunes. But first, today's comment of the cast. Every episode, we highlight a comment left either on taxpayer.com or through social media. Last week, Alberta CTF Director Derek Fildebrandt told us about a $1.1 million sole source contract to a company represented by a well-connected political group's president in, conveniently, Alberta Premier Allison Redford's home riding. Douglas Mischke made us laugh when he commented on our Facebook page, quote, I can smell it here in Southern Ontario, and that's saying something, given all the smells out this way. It really does smell funny, doesn't it? It's just too convenient that a $1.1 million sole source provincial government contract could be handed to a company whose vice president is also the leader of a big ratepayers group in the Premier's own riding. Thanks for commenting, Douglas. I think we'll all be holding our noses together. We want to hear from you. You can check out our website at taxpayer.com or email me at bc.director at taxpayer.com. You can follow the CTF on Twitter at taxpayer.com or myself at Jordan Bateman. And you can engage on our Facebook page like Douglas did at facebook.com slash taxpayer.com. You can also leave a comment on this video on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash taxpayer.com. Drop us a note and you could be our comment of the cast next time. My guest today is an award-winning reporter a documentary filmmaker, one of the original muckraking bloggers, and now an assistant professor of journalism at Mount Royal University in Calgary. Sean Holman for years ran the wildly popular BC news site Public Eye Online, and our loss was the next generation of reporters' gain. I can't say enough good things about Sean and how hard he worked to, build, to bring power to account. And now he's back with a regular column called Sean Holman's Unknowable Country, which gave me the perfect excuse to interview him today. Sean, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Well, let's start with The Unknowable Country, which features several posts already at seanholman.com. Tell me about what drew you back to regular writing and what readers can expect from this series. Well, really, throughout my journalistic career, one of my big motivational factors, one of the big reasons why I did what I did, was to hold power to account. Uh, that I think shone through in the kind of reporting that I did. But, you know, there's a lot of structural issues that stand in the way of accountability and transparency in this country. And a lot of those issues I wasn't really able to tackle doing journalism on a daily basis. So now that I'm in academia, I have an opportunity to think a little bit more about some of the things that really do stand in the way of democracy in this country, in British Columbia, and that's what I'm writing about now on The Unknowable Country. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. I mean, so much of journalism now is, is tied to the issue of the moment, you know, what's the latest Rob Ford revelation? We don't have a chance to step back sometimes and think about the bigger picture. Um, you're someone who actually you know, made his reputation uh, quite a bit on freedom of, of information requests, for example, cultivating sources, good old fashioned gumshoe reporting. Um, how, can we can encourage, how can we can encourage those kind of investigative journalists to come out of the woodwork and uh, how can we train and equip them? Well, that's a really good question. I think the one big point that I would make actually right off the start is I think it's very difficult to do that in Canada. One of the things I think a lot of people don't understand is just how difficult it is to get information out of the government in this country. 
and the lack of availability of public record information, information that's just available to ordinary everyday citizens. If you look down in the states, for example, they have so much more public information, public record information than we do up in this country. That doesn't seem right to me. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of journalists in this country and a lot of people who you know talk about politics in this country think that the public doesn't really care about that, think that it's sort of an inside baseball issue. Well, I think we should be talking more about these kind of inside baseball issues because it really goes fundamentally to how our country is governed and, and the amount of influence that ordinary everyday people have over the powerful in this country. So that's why I'm writing uh, about uh, these kind of issues on the unknowable country. Uh, and I hope that by writing more about these issues, by drawing attention to these kind of issues, that it will help better equip the next generation of journalists to tackle these problems. Because, you know, at, at some point in time, we really do have to think, what kind of country are we living in? What kind of country do we want to live in? And are we really satisfied with the amount of information that we have available as citizens of this country? Yeah. It's, that's a great point, and and one of the uh, one of your most recent posts actually dealt with something near and dear to the CTF's heart, which is simple accountability, transparency on MLA and other politician expenses. Uh, you know, an Ipsos Reid poll found a majority of Canadians say, "Yeah, give us this information. We may never look at it, but give it to us so that the, the watchdogs can." Um, why are politicians so reluctant to even give us that very basic level of transparency? I think it goes to the way in which this country is governed and has been governed for a very, very long time. Um, let me be clear. The public, I think, kind of thinks that decisions are made, political decisions are made in legislatures in this country. That's not what happens at all. What instead happens is MLAs, MPs get together in closed door meetings, usually caucus, cabinet, other kinds of meetings like that, and they make decisions on what is going to happen, what position their party, what position the government is going to take on any given issue. And then they go into the sunshine of the legislature, where these decisions are actually supposed to be made, and they simply reiterate the decisions that they've already made. And because we have such strict party discipline in this country, um, the governing party, the party that has a majority of MPs or MLAs in the legislature, are essentially able to carry out, without interference, most of the decisions that they make in private. And I think that creates an assumption that decision-making has to happen in private. And I think that's permeated Canadian society. I think it's had a dramatic impact on the way public life in this country operates. And I think it's time we really took a look at that and thought about, you know, is this the kind of country that we want to live in? Is, do we really want to live in an unknowable country? Yeah, amazingly, that same Ipsos Reid poll, you know, only about a third of people, a third of Canadians, wanted their MP to have more power. Which, That's right. Uh, Mind-boggling to people like you and I, right? I mean... Uh, how could that possibly be that low a number? That's right. And, and you know, it, it's, it's interesting, too, because, you know, the, you know, going back to your earlier point about the fact that Canadians want information going out to the public about, you know, MP expenses, Senate expenses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, people who are in those positions don't feel under any obligation to release that information because of the way in which decision making operates in this country. And going back to you know the other aspect of the poll, which is the fact that Canadians really weren't too enthusiastic about having individual MPs have more of a say, only 30% uh, said that that would influence them to vote for the Tories. Well, I, I think that really points to the kind of culture we live in. I, I really sometimes wonder just how much of a democracy Canadians actually want. I mean, if you put in front of them a number of various different policy options and said, okay, you know, we can get climate change legislation, for example, but that means individual MPs won't be able to have a say, or we can cut the deficit 
Uh, but that means individual MPs won't have a say. I think a lot of Canadians actually would be comfortable with that choice. And I think that speaks to the kind of culture that we have. Yeah, a great example is MP pension reform, which really came because one day Prime Minister Harper decided enough was enough yeah. and he was going to take the biggest pay cut of all. And lo and behold, it gets done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I think, again, I think we really need to think about what kind of culture do we have in this country? What kind of political culture do we have in this country? And are we satisfied with that culture at the end of the day? Are we comfortable with that culture at the end of the day? And maybe we are. But I think it's really time for us to have that conversation, to look at Canadian culture in the mirror, to look at the kind of democracy we have in the mirror, and actually take a hard look at it and, and think about whether or not we want to make some, I think, fairly dramatic changes. And I think you made a great contribution to building that mirror that we should be looking in with your, what I'm hoping is your first documentary, Whip, The Secret World of Party Discipline, which was released earlier this year, and dug into the behind-the-scenes efforts that political parties put into controlling their MLAs and MPs on votes. Never has the term trained seals been used so quickly and, 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 and so relevantly. But, you know, I, I want to talk about this in depth, but, but first, you know, was, was, this, what, was what drew you to this documentary simply the f outflow of you spending all those years in the BC legislature and seeing trained seals up close and personal? Yeah, I mean, it really was. And, I mean, I started covering provincial politics politics in general because I'm very interested in public policy and I thought that when I went down to the legislature that that's what I would see debates over public policy but that's not what happened at all because what you essentially have is two sides down at the legislature for the most part um, you know one side has their opinion the other side has another opinion uh, the majority always gets its way uh, there's no debate, really, or discussion. Um, it's just essentially two sides yelling at one another. Um, and that's unfortunate. And I think, it, I, I think a lot of MLAs, not all MLAs, but I think there are at least some MLAs who aren't entirely comfortable with that, who wish the system was different. Um, but they find it very difficult to speak out about that. And that was part of what I tried to accomplish uh, with the documentary, was giving a forum for MLAs to talk about that situation, to talk about how uncomfortable they felt about it. Yeah, therapy almost. Now, it, it was really, <laughs> actually, that's, a, that's actually a really good point. Um, because I, I think a lot of these MLAs, they really wanted to get this off their chest. They really wanted to have an opportunity to talk about it. But it's very, very difficult because, you know, caucus confidentiality, cabinet confidentiality, caucus discipline, uh, cabinet discipline, solidarity, that all gets in the way of them actually being able to have an honest conversation with the people who elected them about the way in which our system of government really functions. It's shocking that they have been unable to this point to actually be able to, to talk to the citizens of BC about how British Columbia's political system and the political system across this country, I should add, uh, in most jurisdictions, really works. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one of your clips was from former social credit MLA Nick Lonan, who I, I should note is a friend of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. In fact, the CTF honored him with the uh, uh, Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal earlier this year. But, I mean, way back in 1991, I mean, I'm in high school at this point, Nick is drawing attention to the idea that party discipline was damaging democracy. 22 years later, is it fair to say it's only gotten worse? I would say it's only gotten worse. Uh, I mean, it's difficult for me to say because I wasn't reporting 20 years ago. Um, but I do think that the level of rigidity uh, uh, in the system has increased. And I would say that reporters are partially to blame for that. Um, we do have a tendency to take a look at uh, MLAs, politicians, MPs who break ranks, as you know being rebels as you know being not on side with the leader as there being divisions in caucus etc 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 rather than treating it as simply a legitimate disagreement over policy so i think you know the media needs to take some responsibility for that too although it would be too easy to blame the media uh, um, entirely for that i think politicians must take the lion's share of responsibility uh, for this situation, uh, you know, even if we do have a tendency to, as reporters, uh, 
criticize that kind of behavior at times or mischaracterize it, uh, a lot of politicians could be a lot braver than they uh, are right now. And I think that would help break this situation that we have right now where you know breaking ranks is such an unusual thing rather than a normal and accepted part of political practice in this country. Yeah, well, I think of Bill Bennett, who's now the Minister of Energy. I mean, Bennett one day, well, Bennett has you know some philosophical disagreements with his BC Liberal Party over the years. A great speech, uh, ripping the carbon tax, which I quote all the time at the, at the Taxpayers Federation, delivers a scathing tirade one day against uh, Premier Campbell, the ultimate maverick, and now is the Minister of Energy under Campbell's successor and towing the party line like a, like a good soldier. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and you know that is what happens, right? It can be very easy to be seduced, I think, by the system. Not speaking specifically of Bill Bennett, but, you know, there are a lot of benefits that come, that come within the political system for towing the party line, for agreeing to tow the party line. Um, and I think that's a large portion of why people do stay in line, because they're waiting for those benefits, because they're waiting for that cabinet spot. Um, and, you know, they have... Uh, I suppose, look themselves in the mirror and say, you know, is that really what we came here for? Um, is that really what this is all about? Uh, shutting up, not speaking out on behalf of constituents, not speaking out uh, on behalf of their own conscience and just waiting for that cabinet or critic promotion that will give them theoretically more power behind the scenes, but we don't really know because we can't see inside yep. these cabinet or caucus meetings to see whether the discussions that they claim are taking place are actually taking place or making any of a difference. Oh, uh, Sean, we had open a ca open cabinet meetings for about you know a cup of coffee or so in BC, and those had to have been exactly like the behind the scenes ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> now. Uh, just jumping back to Nick Lonan really quickly, after he left politics, he wrote a book, Citizenship and Democracy, A Case for Proportional Representation, which really became a foundational text for any Canadian wanting to change the way that MPs or MLAs are elected. Do you think proportional representation or some change to the voting system is the quickest, the best way to, to alter this situation? Or is it just as simple as getting the right person into the PMO or the Premier's office and have them voluntarily devolve some of their powers? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, because when I went on tour for the documentary, I often got asked, well, what can be done about this whole entire situation? What, what could be done to address the issue of uh, party discipline? Um, I was someone who did support electoral reform in BC. I supported STV. It was one of the few editorial positions that I ever took as a journalist. Um, but that being said, I think it would be too easy to say that electoral reform or any other kind of structural change is actually going to loosen party discipline or change the way in which politics operates in this country. I think the way in which politics operates in this country has much more to do with the kind of culture we have. I, I think we live still in a fairly deferential culture, um, a culture that's fairly deferential to authority. I think questioning isn't necessarily one of the things that is celebrated in this country, and I think that all plays into the way in which our political system operates. So I think if we're really serious about changing the way politics happens in Canada, I think we really need to take a mirror up to our society as a whole and not just look at the political structures we have, but look, look at the values which we hold and and really have a serious conversation uh, about those values. And until that happens, I think any structural change that is made is going to have a limited effect, um, although I would laud it personally. Yeah, I'd sure like to try at least. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, and I mean, it's certainly not that we, we shouldn't try, but, you know, the state of for example, freedom of information in this country um, is in large measure as a result of this idea that privacy is necessary for decision making. I think that's an idea um, that is held not just by people who operate 
you know, at the highest reaches of government, but I think it might actually be a value that is held by Canadians as a whole. And if Canadians agree with the idea that privacy is necessary for decision making and that some things need to be kept private, very different notion than, you know, the opinions held on the other side of the border. Um, but, but if that's the case, then, you know, it's very difficult to get information from government. It's very difficult to make a case to get information from government. And it's very, very difficult to change the way in which politics operates in this country, which is why I, I call it the unknowable country, because of our values, because I think of the values that we hold. I'm not sure. But because of the values that we hold, I, I think we do live in this fundamentally unknowable place where our ability to get information about the way the country operates is, is inherently limited, and as a result, there are consequences for the kind of democracy we have. Sean, you were the very first person to interview me when I took the job as BC Director of the CTF. I am happy to know that the next generation of journalists is in such good hands. If you want to follow Sean on Twitter, it's at Public Eye Online. Go to his website, SeanHolman.com. Sean, thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Jordan. It was a pleasure. And now it's time for the Waste of the Week, an example of how government is wasting your hard-earned tax dollars. This week, unfortunately, we stay with me right here in British Columbia. A decade ago, BC Rail was leased, the lease could run up to 990 years, to CN. Yet BC Rail continues as a crown corporation and continues to pay six-figure salaries to some staffers. In fact, in fiscal 2012-13, BC Rail paid their Vice President of Operations and Corporate Affairs, Gord Westlake, $160,890 in base salary, plus nearly $16,000 in benefits, $14,000 in RSPs, $11,000 in car allowance, $4,500 in vehicle operating expenses, and $3,400 in unpaid vacation for a grand total of $209,000. The VP of Finance and the CFO, Kevin Steinberg, he made $160,000 in base salary, almost $16,000 in benefits, another $14,000 in RSPs, again, another $10,800 car allowance with another $3,700 in vehicle operating expenses for a grand total of $204,000. That's two $200,000 a year plus employees at a rail company that doesn't own a single train. Shameful. Well, that's it for this episode of Tax Talk from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. You can check out our website at taxpayer.com or email me at bc.director at taxpayer.com. You can follow the CTF on Twitter at taxpayer.com or myself at Jordan Bateman. And you can engage on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash taxpayer.com and leave a comment on this video on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash taxpayer.com. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time, I'm Jordan Bateman asking you to remember this quote from George Washington. Quote, Government is not reason. It is not eloquent. It is force. Like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. Take care, everyone.